Thank you for coming back. In this hour, we will talk about the Justice, Justice Transition Awareness Survey in High Emission Industry in Taiwan. And we will start with Dr. Wang Reagan with his 20 minutes presentation. And later on, I will talk to you about some policy implications. In the session this afternoon, we will have two presenters from Korea and Japan. We will also have Deputy Minister from National Development Council. So this is the sessions and the agenda that we will have this afternoon to talk about just transition. And net zero policy will have a lot of social impact, even though they haven't fully uh, emerged yet, but we need to be prepared for that. In the morning, we have heard about issues in different scenarios, so we need to find suitable pathway for us to overcome those issues. So now we'll invite the Professor Wong to give us the 20 minutes presentation. Good afternoon. Thank you for attending this event to think about how we can ensure just transitions around the world. Just transition is a very popular topic in COP27 this year with many important decisions. So two kinds of countries are especially concerned about this issue. Developing countries are concerned about this issue because they need some buffer zone to um, think about their zero, uh, net zero policy and strategy. For wealthy countries, if they do not address just transitions properly, it will jeopardize social security as well as their ruling. Therefore, wealthy countries are concerned about this. While authoritarian countries define their just justice according to the authoritarians, um, for democratic countries, um, the just transition should be decided together with the society. Over the past few years, several countries around the world have been implemented uh, just transitions, and this number has been increasing. If you include the JETP, the Just Transitions Partnership, uh, Just Energy Transition Partnership. There will be more and more countries included in the just transition. And it's an important topic for COP27 and for COP28 as well. And for Taiwan, it is an important topic for the next two or three decades. Therefore, in November this year, we have a awareness survey in high emissions industries in Taiwan. We choose the industries based on the official statistics in Taiwan. In this survey, we include small and medium-sized enterprises as well because they will be impacted by just transitions and net zero policy as well. So initially, we select these 15 different sectors. In the past, we didn't know that fishery or certain industries will be, in, will be impacted as well. For example, uh, for wastewater management, they are also related to net zero policy as well, as they will uh, emit a lot of methane in the process. In the survey, we ask the first question, do you know about net zero policy? 
According to our survey, even though they are in the high emission industries, 66% of respondents do not understand at all about net zero policy. So it indicates that among these high emission industries, so many people are not aware of this important policy to them. So, in comparison to other questions that people know more about uh, pandemic relief or uh, pen uh, pension systems in Taiwan, however, they are not aware of the net zero policy in Taiwan at all. Because they are not aware of the net zero policy, they don't think that it will impact themselves too much regarding to their works. However, in the cross examinations, we noticed that actually in fishery, a lot of people think that the debt zero policy will impact their work and their employment severely because that they have experienced, for example, offshore wind power or um, solar powers on the fish pound. So these are all the impact that fishery participants have been aware of the net zero policy. So in the 2050 net zero targets, if we are going to minimize our fossil fuels and how concerned they are regarding to their futures. And you can see that 7.9% more respondents actually feel concerned when we are minimizing the use of fossil fuels. So as you can see on the slide that multiple industries and sectors are concerned about net zero policy when they realize that they will have to minimize their usage of fossil fuels. Since there's the oil and power price fluctuations are impacting their daily life. And we want to ask them that, do you know that actually zero, net zero policy will impact on oil and power energy prices? So when they realize that net zero policy are related to um, oil prices or electricity prices, they are much more concerned about the net zero policy. And also, if these people are managers in small companies or medium-sized company, they are very sensitive to oil prices and electricity prices. So a lot of managers in companies are very sensitive when there are fluctuations in oil and electricity prices. And also, 60.3% of respondents are aware that how oil and electricity prices will impact on their household expenditures. And you can see on this slide that if you have the mid-income if you are the mid-income owners and household, you are very sensitive to oil prices and um, electricity prices fluctuation. Because the fluctuations will have a huge impact on the disposable income they have in their household. In this slide, we ask them about um, low carbon transportations. In the net zero policy, we will have to change our transportation model. Actually, 30% to 35% of respondents think that this net zero policy will not have impact or they will only have minimal impact on their transportation habits. However, also, 
44% of respondents think that the net zero policy and carbon-free transportation will have huge impact to their daily life. It means that in this polarized situation, some people have already adapted to the carbon-free、uh, transportations, while other people are still lagging behind, and that's something we noticed in the survey as well. There are different category and different types of just transitions, and most of people agree that if you emit a lot of carbon, you have more responsibility to reduce carbon emission. Also, fifty-five percent of respondents are worried that the responsibility of reducing carbon will be transferred to employees. How and also we notice that a lot of senior、uh, managers or company owners in this、uh, survey are concerned that these responsibility will be transferred to their employees or it will be transferred to private sectors. So for these、um, company owners or senior managers. Their decisions will impact and influence how、uh, their companies will survive in the just transition process. For example, if you hear a rumor that National Taiwan University will be closed very soon. Then people will start to be worried, and if the presidents or senior officials in National Taiwan University starting to worry that the the school may be closed, then it becomes a very serious issue. So that's something that we have to notice that when company owners or senior managers in the companies are worried about just transition. And it becomes a very serious issue that we have to take it very seriously. And 47 percent of respondents hope to know about how governments will address the net zero policy and the impact of this policy. 75 percent of respondents argue that. Government should engage with industries and employees in the process for solutions. So, in the future, the net zero communications should not be unilateral. It should be bilateral. Government should engage with industries and employees to find solutions. And 83 percent of respondents thinks that before the policy are announced, they should be fully communicated in advance. They want to know about potential implications and solutions. So 83 percent of respondents think that they should be communicated and discussed before the policy are announced. And also, when these policy creates damages to companies or laborers,、uh, how much of them should be compensated? So, if you, if so of course, in these questions, that many employees or companies think that they should be. At least half or more compensated by their loss under the net zero policy. And of course, that the senior managers are more realistic in those compensations. They understand and they know that government will not compensate for all of your loss losses during the net zero policy. And also. Most respondents hope that they can have a legislations to subsidize and compensate some of the losses incurred by net zero policy. 
in the past that individual sectors will be compensated or will be addressed by individual ministries or government authorities. However, most respondents hope that in the future there will be a designated uh, legislation to protect them or to compensate them or to uh, minimize their losses under the net zero policy. So I think that that's the common uh, opinion among our respondents. Last but not the least, um, as we all know, as we are advancing with the net zero policy, for example, in the past, we are going to remove or fade out from the fossil fuel cars, fossil fuel trucks, or motorcycles. A lot of users, I mean, the drivers and the people, they feel like um, they were tabooed. It's like they were named or labeled as someone is pol someone polluting the environment. So um, we made a survey. Um, asking them if the government um, made an announcement about this, what do you feel that if we want to fade out from these vehicles? And actually the people, they feel, yes, I mean, from the respondents, they say, yeah, we feel like we are labeled that we were um, polluting the environment because we use um, fossil fuel cars. But um, the answer is right here. The thing is, when you made the decision to control this industry and you have these policies or you want to take these actions, you must invite the citizens in advance, telling them, now we are going toward net zero. I know we know it's a difficult job, but we need your participation. So if these stakeholders were invited in advance, that would be much more helpful instead of for example, they receive the um, information only from a social media group saying that, okay, oh, the news report says you can no longer drive your, tr your truck, and they took it by surprise. So this is a big issue. I think that is what we need to pay attention to. Um, with all these efforts, of course, there we can derive insight and comments from these survey results. So now I'll hand the microphone to Professor Zhou. Professor Wong, that was really a passionate presentation. In comparison to um, Professor Sun Jun from um, Korea, you are also very enthusiastic. So um, we have enthusiastic, enthusiastic presenter here as well. So we hope to see enthusiastic civil participation as well. So around the world, um, as we look at just a transit around the world. There are cases for laborers, and of course we saw that the yellow vest movement in France. At that time, it was Macron, the then and also now incumbent French prime minister. Um, he reduced, he, he tried to remove the um, fossil fuel tax, but at the same time he made other regulations that did not go together. Uh, for example, um, asking people not to drive fossil fuel cars. And in Taiwan, as we also have similar measures, we want to take better control or monitoring the use, carbon emission of big trucks um, in the process of net zero. I think these are all very common issues. In our research, as you all know, this is academic research. We have restraints. So we look at the high carbon emission industries. So we had 500 surveys and we asked um, Zhonghua Agency for the market survey. Um, we look into the high level managers and also C-suite and of course labor um, level, um, labor circle. So, um, Professor Wang, he shares some data here. I would like to illustrate more of the image, the picture. 
So um, for Just Transit, actually, we do not show, I mean, we do not really ask people about, oh, what do you feel about um, net zero and reducing carbon emission? And but um, we'll ask, um, how do you feel about um, current emission policy, etc. And those people, I mean, some of them, they do not quite understand why the government is um, going through this process of reducing current emission to 90%. Actually, 81% of the people surveyed, they say they do not understand why government is implementing this policy. And one of our question is that um, they reflect their opinion. I mean, about half of the surveyed, they really want to know more about why the government is implementing these strategies. And as to just transit, uh, or also um, carbon emission reduction policies, more than 75% of the surveyed, they want to be part of it. And also about 83% um, of the surveyed, um, they are very interested in doing more and joining hands with the government. So that way, it means um, people are urgent to know. They really want to know what's happening in these aspects. This is a new topic, carbon emission reduction and net zero, etc. I mean, it takes time for people to fully understand. People want to participate in it. And as we are preparing the policy to be launched, to be implemented, we need more time to communicate for communication. And we have to admit, a lot of times when we um, establish some public policy campaign, a lot of times the communication is not refined or we are missing the details. So like we heard in the morning, in other countries, they might have to spend hundreds, I mean, if not tens, but also hundreds of seminars or communication sessions with the people. So now in one of our reports, we also look at, for example, symbiosis of the fishing industry, aquaculture industry, and also according to our survey res results, people are very sensitive to the price hikes of fuels and electricity. So we ask people, um, do you find any possible cost increase in your household expenditure, etc. And also most of the surveyed, actually they are in the mid um, level income. They are in the medium level of all the surveyed. Um, because um, as we look into the surveyed body, um, of course we have fragile or voluntary, uh, volatile parties, but um, the median income level, this segment of people, um, they are actually a majority of people, I mean, or the, the group who should pay more attention to. And who should be held mostly accountable? Uh, most of the surveyed people say those who emit more carbon, they should be held accountable, sharing more responsibility. And also, um, many people surveyed, they feel that um, in the future, um, as the companies or corporate parties, they are held accountable for carbon emission, then actually a part of the responsibility will be transferred to the people. And as to subsidies or compensations, um, many, well, actually, a majority of the surveyed, they want to receive compensation. And also the surveyed, they wish that there will be a specific law or act um, regarding these matters. And as to the um, fossil fuel trucks, um, um, actually, at that time, um, the government had communication sessions with the truck um, union, but um, they did not really reach out, they did not really reach out to the drivers. So the drivers, they feel um, they are neglected. And for them, they feel that, well, I want to protect the environment. I'm not polluting the air, I mean, in purpose. So they are stigmatized. They feel they are left out. So um, the diesel fuel cars, the diesel fuel trucks, um, and that was part of the issues we had in Taiwan. So um, who are involved, um, whom are our communication target and stigmatization, who is stigmatized? These are the stakeholders and also the interest parties that we should try to identify. 
and even though you might be in different positions, that we are looking into this matter from different perspectives. As we are quickly moving toward net zero, I believe stakeholders will feel and would have very, very much tangible、um, feelings about this matter. So in Taiwan, I have to say we have a problem that、um, our energy transformation is going too slow. Actually, around the world, around 2010, renewable energies in different parts of the world have been rising. However, in Taiwan, our renewable energy became a political issue, and we've been delayed for so long. And the reason why the power production of renewable energy in Taiwan is so low. Um, is really political, and then when it comes to green economy chains, we are way too behind. So if you look at、um, the fossil fuel prices, water prices, now that we are not yet reaching green electricity,、um, a lot of things now、um, we are under the pressure from around the world. For example, um, twenty fifth in twenty fifteen, we talked about Paris Agreement. We want to have The temperature rise of the world be controlled within two degrees centigrade, and also each country must agree that they reduce carbon emission by at least fifty percent. A series of measures, all this taking place around the world, delivers negative impact to Taiwan because we are still lagging behind, and even though we are. But we are moving toward energy transformation, so we are under a lot of pressure. And whoever wants to be the next president of Taiwan, this will be a very tricky issue. And in Taiwan, the high carbon emission and also high power consumption companies or industries need more attention. For example, the carbon tax, and also、um, according to the Clean Power Act in the United States and also Japan. These countries are implementing carbon tax, and also、um, they demand 100% green supply chain. And for example,、um, Taiwan Mobile,、um, like、um, Chairman Tsai said in the morning, they are dedicating as much as 30 billion NT dollars for green transformation. So Taiwan is now forced to start to launch its. Energy transformation, but at the same time,、um, we want to deliver drastic carbon emission reduction. It's like、um, we have to get ready and have the seatbelt ready because it's going to be a difficult and bumpy journey. So, in the government, I think、um, they are、uh, promoting big policies, and under the big umbrella,、um, some smaller policies can be. Brought over or be,、um, or be、um, put in place. Take if、uh, take effect、um, altogether. For example, um, in the semiconductor industry, TSMC、um, is committed to green energy, and also they take control of carbon emission. And if I am a vendor of TSMC, because since our products will be part of TSMC's products. Um, exporting to Europe, of course, the whole supply chain will have to adhere and follow green energy and green protocols. So in Taiwan, we still have many, as many as 150,000 SMEs. So, for example, I could be a big company,、um, for example, Delta or TSMC, and in my supply chain, I have 2,000 of them. However, Among this, maybe seven or eight out of this um two thousand um vendors, only these small number have problem with carbon emission. And as TFMC, it's our responsibility to support these vendors. So now we have three ways to review carbon emission. One is EPA, and then Academia Sinica. And also, we have Bureau of Trade,、uh, Bureau of Industrial Development, and they are still integrating the resources. But now we have these scales ready. And next, how do we how do we distinguish the disadvantaged 
and also how do we identify the median the median income group and also the um, fragile group as we all know net zero and carbon emission reduction is very important they will identify the um, weakened group and so that we can have different measures we may all become vulnerable groups in the process because of the transitions we will see fluctuations or price hike in energy, oil, tax, or consumer prices. Uh, we have to identify those vulnerable groups and prepare them for the transition. For example, you may have um, certain um, subsidies or you may have some um, wafer for consumers or household um, under certain threshold of income. We hope that um, the governments can start with um, carbon fee first, and maybe three years later, then you will have a carbon tax. So you need to have a phase out process, and with all these carbon tax, you can start a just transition fund in order to compensate or support those vulnerable groups. It is quite challenging at the moment because when EPA um, wanted to start the carbon fee, um, governments have done a lot of communication and discussion since 2020. They receive a lot of pressure from industries, but obviously it is inevitable to us in the future, and many countries are doing this already. So vulnerable communities or vulnerable groups may have different features or they may have different backgrounds, they will need more uh, clearly defined um, standards. So we need to identify that even within the capital Taipei City, there are still people in the vulnerable categories. So it's not a regional difference. It's also a demographic and also um, community-based situations. You also need to think about middle income household because this middle income household will also be impacted by these new policy and fluctuations in oil and power prices. I think governments should also support uh, companies in the governance and in the transitions. So many company owners and senior managers are already concerned that this narrow uh, net zero policy will have pressure on their employees. Many companies in Taiwan are agile and resilient, but we need to identify issue first and help to find them solutions as fast as possible. For these high emission industries, they have to think about multiple issues such as CBAM, there are also ESG issues and TCFD issues. Many of these regulations require um, transition for these companies. So we suggest governments to work with NGOs, universities, and local groups to develop new society, new economy, and also new production models because this net, row, net, net zero process will apply and impact most of the people. So you need to try to be comprehensive and try to be more um, detailed as possible. And in the detailed process, you may be able to identify those potential vulnerable groups 
that rely on a lot of、um, social works and a lot of、um, social engineering as well. Once again, we emphasize that you, the government, need to do more in communications, engagements, and sharing information. As we have said before in our survey, most people do not understand the impact and implications of net zero policy on their business or on their daily life. Therefore, we need to have、um, information transparency, and many of these policies, such as carbon fee or carbon tax, will impact on business operations. You will see many of these. Impact emergence in the near future. In the communication process, the government should also clearly define the benefits of、um, just transitions, and also what are the、um, potential opportunities for these stakeholders. Currently, we do not have any bottom-up mechanisms to explain about just transition. I think that the government need to do more in their communication with different sector and different、um, demographic groups in Taiwan. And of course, that government also need to think about how to share the benefits across different groups in the society. Once again, this is a multi-channel and multi-faceted process. I think. There are a lot of similarities between Taiwan and Korea in the process, and I asked、uh, Professor Yun、um, previously that now the carbon emissions in Ta- in Korea is still increasing, and、um, in Taiwan we are facing the sim- similar situations. The carbon emission continue to grow as well over the years.、Uh, for example, in Korea, they have increased 100 million tons over a decade, and、um, some people would suggest that in Taiwan we can have the companies to purchase carbon rights and carbon credits in order to compensate their commissions.、Um, I think that's a solution, but we still need to have communication with everyone in the process. So this is the survey that we have for the Just Transitions Awareness Survey in High Emission Industry in Taiwan. So that's our presentation today. Thank you. Maybe we can open up the floor for questions. If there are any questions from journalists or from the audience here. Any questions from journalists or the audience here? I'm a journalist. Now we are seeing a short supplies in green energy in Taiwan. Many large companies are fighting for、um, green energy. So. Under these situations, how do we support these high emission industries? How do we allocate the limited green energy that we have so far in Taiwan? Should we prioritize those high emission industries? Maybe we can collect a few more questions before we answer them co-、uh, collectively. Um, maybe some some of you are still thinking about、uh, questions you may have in your mind. Maybe I can respond to you first.、Um, according to our statistics, 
from 2001 to 2016, our renewable energy only accounted for around 1% of our power mix in Taiwan if you exclude the hydropower. And the current government is pushing very hard on renewable energies, um, even though that we will have 200 offshore wind turbine by the end of this year, uh, we are still catching up. Um, around 1 p.m. each day, um, ideally that we will have 13 to 4, 13 percent of our power come from solar. However, um, Wind power still constitute only 1% or less than 1% to our power mix. So we need to do much more. If we can have 15% or 20% of our power coming from green energy, then it will be an easier topic to discuss. However, our developments in green energy have been stagnant or growing slowly in the past few years. And currently, much of our green energy is purchased by TSMC, the major semiconductor companies in Taiwan. And when the governments announced that they want to allocate at least 10% of green energy to smaller and medium-sized companies, we need to look clear carefully about how they should do this because we still have short supply in green energy. Thank you. So I can respond to you as well. We work with a weekly magazines in Taiwan to have a survey regarding to listed companies in Taiwan. And according to our survey, our industries are aware of this issue as well. Quite a few high emissions industries are starting to install those green energy generation facilities. So based on all these studies and statistics, we can see that when governments and industries work together, um, green energy installation and deployment will be much faster. So for those traditional high emission industries, we hope and urge the government to support these major power users to install and to implement green energy generations as much as possible on their premise. Currently, if you if you want to apply for um, green energy subsidy from the government, you need to meet a certain threshold. So we suggest the government to lower the threshold so more companies will be able to participate. Thank you. So, in our recent survey, we didn't cover livestock industry. Of course, that we know that livestock industry in Taiwan is important. However, the proportions of their uh, greenhouse gas emission is comparatively lower. So this time we focus on sewage and waste management. This time we have an initial survey, but in the future, of course, we need to cover more expat in agriculture. So this time we did not include livestock industry. 
And yes, we include semiconductor industries in our survey this time. I didn't mention that, but it's included. So we uh, include those high power usage companies as well. So of course, that's the semiconductor industries included in our survey this time. And in our cross check, there may be um, different attitudes and different responses in different industries. We will continue to follow up on this to see whether these companies or these industries have different responses over time, or they have changed their minds or changed their perceptions. Dr. Guo have mentioned that when we work with Business Weekly magazine, we design the survey, and we distribute the survey to more than 140 companies listed in Taiwan Stock Exchange. And many respondents have mentioned that they will generate and they will prioritize green energy. But the issue here is, of course, about whether we have sufficient green energy to support them or not. And I see another issue, another question from the Slido that in the past that NTU have a survey on energy poverty and what kind of government strategy that they need to do with energy poverty. So this is really challenging. Actually, um, four to five years ago, we had another forum. At that time, we had a preliminary report based on our um, literary review from, re um, from research around the world. So um, if you have 40% of your household income or mo more than that um, dedicated in energy, you have to save as much as 40% of your income for energy. That means you are energetic, you are poor in energy. That is the definition. However, um, of course, we need to um, accommodate to different conditions. And speaking about just transit is not just about a policy per se. We need precise data and information. One thing is that um, we need to build a long-term database. And also, if there's sensitive personal information, we need to find solutions to, for example, encryption or to protect um, personal information. But I would say um, it depends on which approach we prefer. Um, we need to make arrangement in advance when we are conducting research. Um, for example, background research, that is something you must pay attention to. But that is, I mean, um, collecting long-term data that is inevitable, that is something you must do. So for just a transit, and also how do we deal with families that is poor in energy? Um, for example, if you look at the lowest weekly income, etc., how do we calculate that? Oh, this is a really difficult question because um, in a question it says um, um, we have a wide recognition. I mean, it's a wide range for so-called domestic income. So there are people who are capable to work but did not go to work. So how do we um, differentiate these different conditions? So since we have professors here, um, actually, um, next question is about um, do you have um, any idea um, how to include just transit into the Climate Change Response Act. To draft, actually, our new act, okay? We need collective effort to make a fair response to this. It's not that the government is not doing anything. It's just we need to go through the right approach and right process. So now, um, as we have some disputes on the Gas Electricity Act, this act, um, I think the, par the primary concern in the legislative yuan is that um, they have 
um, some, for example, um, carbon neutrality commission. And what we need is that we need to have a, um, a climate expert commission instead of um, sustainability. I mean, these are different. Different countries, they have carbon budget. Now, more and more countries are taking care of this matter. For example, they will arrange a schedule, a agenda for carbon emission reduction. And in the carbon electricity law, um, I think um, the Climate Change Act, I think um, it also acts for a specific regulation that we now we have four chapters. So for f just transit, it should be included as part of the Climate Change Act. For example, when you are forced to go through business transformation, so who is a vulnerable segment, who is a vulnerable group, I mean, it should be identified and supported. That is that is still missing in our Climate Change Act. So that is something we need to modify in the future. Thank you, Professor Zhou, uh, for explaining the Climate Change Act. Now, also, I look at internet comment. Um, people are interested in how to define and distinguish the median income family. Especially in Taiwan, we have a wide range of so-called domestic income. People might not be getting salary, but they are working or they are capable of working. Well, for this issue, actually in our center, actually in our questionnaire at that time, we did have some conditions or preferred setting for income. For example, um, actual salary. Um, actually, a lot of people and also business, they refrain from revealing their income. So in addition to disclosing your income, also um, in academic research, we have, I mean, we can modify the question. We can say, OK, what do you feel? Do you think you should be categorized in this um, income bracket or whichever, which else income bracket? So actually, due to um, Con some constraint actually will remove the question. But I think that is a really good question. It's like I feel um, I should belong to a income group. Um, maybe people are, re are afraid of really disclosing their income. They may not be honest. Or it could be they are making money, but um, um, due to inflation or other pressure, maybe they identify themselves. For example, they have a monthly income of fifty thousand or sixty thousand NT dollars, but they still feel they are medium income people. So, um, all these questions, as we are thinking about just the transit in the process, how can we subtly, delicately define the different income group and how they respond to net zero? and carbon reduction. And for example, they might be concerned about the rising cost of fuel, electricity. They might worry about their job. So um, not only the design of the questionnaire, uh, maybe we can expand the survey. I mean, we can also look into um, what they feel. So we can add more questions. So um, I think there will be a future direction that we will explore. I hope that answers your question. We still have six minutes. So one of the questions, as I see, um, the other aspect of energy transit, just transit, is the Aboriginal tribes and also the agricultural villages, etc. So actually, from the survey in RSPRC, indeed, um, sometimes you need to add, or for example, um, ask for more samples in that specific group. 
And as you you all know, in social science, there are some restraints, of course, in our survey and research. It's like if you ask people what you feel about, then actually it's really a level of concern. Or we can leverage a focus group or interview. Then we can know more about where the questions are, where the problems are. So with multiple attempts and more survey, then we can better define the scope of the issue. Actually, on March thirtieth this year,、um, in the 行政 in 行政院 in administrative 院 um, as they announced the 2050 net zero goals, social policy is also included. And as you were invited to the meeting, um. Social communication is indeed very important. The National Science Council, as they are also organizing events for social science and also involvement from this field to contribute to a smoother、um, just transit. Of course, we had some preliminary survey and analysis. We still need your support, and it is our hope that just like in EU. All the project here should be a problem-oriented project. For example, we set up the problem. We have the key. We have the pain points ahead. We want to solve the issue, and then we trust or or we invite the institutions to provide solutions. So a lot of work need to、um, a lot of work require cross dis disciplinary collaboration. Well, I totally agree. Um, we need more than one institutions, and in our plan,、um, we think it requires more layers,、uh, more subtle layers to develop. So the National Development Council,、um, it is our job to consolidate、um, different opinions and resources from, for example, National Development Council.、Um, Or other scientific institutions, so we can、um, have more cross-disciplinary、um, discussion and collaboration. And I think you've heard me multiple times.、Um, cross-disciplinary that is really the weakest point for the government when it comes to governance. And many departments, including the, the Ministry of Transportation,、um, they look at net zero. Transportation. They had a communication. They have a、um, campaign session. However, as we looked into their measure, they started within the ministry or the department. And、I've, in the future, we need a framework to integrate everything. And so, a dedicated part. Um, as we have Su Ke He, Deputy Chairperson,、um, as he will be our panelist in our next session,、um, I encourage everyone to raise a question to him. And I agree that this is something that people pay much attention to, so we can、um, prevent the protests from happening. We can try to deal with it in advance. Also, I saw a question, for example, in Tainan, the. Green cockroaches. Well, it's appeared in news. Well, it depends. Well, that is closely related to local communities, the governments of local community. For example, here in Taiwan, we have a lot of high tech industries. However, those waste from the scientific parks were directly、uh, excreted to the rivers. So, from the local government,、uh, from the central government to local mafia, so to speak,、um, they are called nuclear mafia. So, in Taiwan, yes, these are the things. These are happening in the news. So, these are really political issues, so to speak. So, how can we make requests to the politicians or statesmen? Well, I wouldn't say it's a energy issue per se. It's really a political. It's a political interaction. Well, and actually, in Taiwan, in our elections, the candidates can be come from mafia. I mean, that is really a phenomenon here. Not only in Tainan we have、um, energy mafia. Well, in not only in Tainan, I guess there will be throughout Taiwan. And here, I would like to share some numbers with you.、Um, 
by November 20th, we had a survey. Um, 56 percent of more than 1,200 um, companies. That was the scope of our survey. So Business Week and also um, Commonwealth, those companies that had investment in Taiwan, 40 percent of these foreign investors, they had once or a few times violated um, waste dumping law. So these companies, these foreign companies, not only they are using our water and electricity, but also they are leaving waste to the local communities. So when there are ecological catastrophe, for example, our rivers are polluted, our food is polluted. Well, I can only tell the administrative department, well, when there's food safety concern, and then it's impossible that you communicate effectively in energy transformation. In Taiwan, we have a lot of issues that require our collective efforts. But as you can see, what's happening in reality, I mean, we need to pay more attention to um, these effects. So I'm really, I'm really grateful and also impressed by the uh, our professor, professor Yun, um, the Korean um, instance, the Korean examples are really um, beacons, I mean, great reference to us. As to Energy transit, I mean, the question was about the vulnerable Aboriginal tribes and also the vulnerable agricultural villages. Well, um, to answer this question, whenever I'm invited to speak on the topic of transit, of just transit, well, I always remind the government if they are um, offering or they are organizing a qualitative research, well, they really need to go to the field and collect the data from these people. Well, in in our SPRC, we're doing similar survey. Well, I also encourage the person or this um, gentleman who raised this question. Well, the thing is, a lot of times these um, vulnerable community, um, their voices are not heard. For example, they had solar panels. Um, they had to. Um, install solar panels but um, um it was in uh, it was made in a very rude way or it's not proper at all that their livelihood and also their rights were invaded then of course you can report to us and we will do i mean that's the value of qualitative survey so due to time constraint we will stop here and we will have a 10 minute break um so we'll stop here if any further question um Feel free to write to me. 